So, do you remember playing the game Punch Bug? Anybody remember that? <laughs> it's like, yeah, three people remember that. That's cool. Um, some people called it Punch Buggy, and I learned this week that some people called it Slug Bug. I'd never heard that. So, uh, it, it was a, see, this was a game that you played while you traveled in the car. If you're under 30, you don't know what I'm talking about, but let me just tell you that there was a time that we took long trips in the car and we did not have smartphones, we did not have tablets, and even DVD players. Can you imagine that? We lived like cavemen. It was, it was a crazy time. So we had to invent games to keep us uh, from, you know, losing our sanity. And it, it was a pretty simple game, punch bug or punch bug or slug bug, that every time someone in the car saw a, a VW bug, a, you would yell, punch bug, and you would punch your brother or sister softly, <laughs> appropriately, in the arm. Now, my boys, I, we have four boys. My wife, Emily, and I have four boys. They are 9, 11, 13, and 15. And they don't, they don't play this. It's not because they, they have electronics. They play a simpler and modified version. It's not called Punch Bug. It's just called Punch. And you don't have to see a bug. You just hit each other. They, it's just, does anybody else have kids that do that? They're just, it's just like it happens on trips, right? So, you know, the purpose of the game was that by the end of the trip, you accumulated whoever had landed the most punches won the game. That was kind of the point of the trip. Now, if you had an extra special trip coming up, your mom might pull out before the trip the auto bingo. <laughs> Does anybody else remember that? Does remember, you, you, you would have these little games, and it was like where you would see things, a railroad or a no parking sign uh, or a tow truck, and every time you did, you, you slid one of these little red translucent things over it, and you could get you know, up and down or diagonal across it. You young people are like, what's going on? This was our Fortnite, man. Come on. This, was, <laughs> this is what it was all about. In fact, do we have a young family who has a trip coming up in a month, maybe Thanksgiving? Has anybody got a trip coming up? Because I have, all right, you get, you get, you got to come get these. You get some auto bingo. It'll entertain your kids for like two minutes and then they'll tell you the touch. They'll be like, dad, the touch screen's not working. What's going on? I think something's, a, where's the volume button? Uh, so that was just what we did. Now, if, now our parents, if the trip was too long and the games just kind of wore off, then we just, you know, laid down across the back seat of the Oldsmobile and went to sleep. And we didn't have seatbelts because our parents didn't really love us. So <laughs> we didn't even know. They're like, the back seat has seatbelts, huh? Who knew? See, the point of the games that we all played, and kids still play games, was that at the end, there was going to be declared a winner and a loser. That when mom or dad put the car in park and turned off the keys, turned off the ignition and took the keys out, it was over. And if you had landed the most punches or seen the most bugs or you had the most little red translucent things, you won. Every family trip had a scoreboard. Did you know life has a scoreboard? Did you know that? Life has a scoreboard. By the way, this was made on Thursday and there was, there is not there, any, any correlation to any scores. I just wanted to say, I, I, I'm not a prognosticator. I'm just telling you. Uh, no matter how you slice it, there's only two people, kinds of people in the world. It's those that feel very much at home with God. And they feel very much at home with church. In fact, Jesus even said that he's, he's planning and preparing a home for them in heaven. And they have found the love and grace and the forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. And they have a relationship with him. They have trusted him as Lord and Savior. And they are just very much at home with God. And I'm so grateful that that's my story. And I hope it is for you. And I, I bet, I know some of you, and I'll bet for many of you that's your story. But there's another group of people too. And it's those who feel like, very much like visitors with God. And they're not sure what they believe about God, and they're not sure kind of where they're at with God, and they're certainly not sure where they're, what they believe about Jesus. And maybe that's you. And you would consider yourself a visitor to church. 
But you came here today because you're curious, you've got some questions, you, you feel something in your heart that you know you want to check out church or you're interested in what God is about, but you're not sure where you stand with God and you're not sure what you believe about Jesus. You might even call yourself a skeptic. Well, I want you to know something if that's you. I'm so glad you came. We're so grateful that you're here. And I want to tell you something that I think I know about you. That really, I want to tell the people on the homes, in the homestands, on the home side, what I think I know about you. And that is when you walk into a church, any church, even this church, you feel very much like a visitor in an opponent's, opponent's stadium. And you don't really feel at home. You, you're kind of out of sorts. You're not sure what the whole scene is about. And the truth is, though, it's not just about when you come with church. That actually your interactions with Christians often outside the walls of the church make you feel like even more of a visitor with God. Because we often send mixed messages. We send so many mixed messages that when we think about Jesus, we think about love and grace and forgiveness, but we often talk about God in such a way that when you think about God or Jesus, you think about condemnation or judgment because the only interactions you ever have with Christians are when they are condemning you or judging you. In fact, it often feels like you are in a competition with Christians that we are in a competition with you. And I want to tell you something. There is a competition, but it's not a competition with you. It's a competition for you. And I just think it's the purpose of the church, the purpose of the Big C Church of Jesus Christ to get as many people as possible from the, home, from the visitor stands over to the home stands. As many people as possible that feel like visitors with God, to feel at home with God. We don't want to defeat you. We want to win you over. We want to invite you over to the home stands. It's not a competition with you. It's a competition for you. Now, this is really important. Because though life has a scoreboard and life uh, has these two sets of people that feel at home with God and those that feel like visitors with God, this is really important because there's going to come a time at some point that the clock on the life scoreboard is going to hit zero, zero, zero. Because eternity has a scoreboard too. And life as we know it and time as we know it is going to end and our Heavenly Father is going to put the car in park and turn the ignition off on this journey and time will be done. And at that time, everyone who has a home with God will be in eternity with God, with their home in Him. And everyone that hasn't done that will be a permanent visitor and they can never cross over to the home side. In fact, When we all breathe our last breath, that happens for each of us. I mean, I have no idea when Jesus is going to come back or when there's going to be an end of time. And a lot of pastors spend a lot of time talking about it. I don't know if it's going to be a thousand years from now. I don't know if it's going to be a week from now. If it's going to be soon, I would appreciate it if Jesus would come back before my boxes are unpacked instead of right after. <laughs> like, don't make me go through all that work. But I don't know. But what I know is that's going to happen or you and I are going to breathe our last breath. And when that happens, we are permanently in one of those numbers. And every person on the face of planet Earth is permanently in one of those numbers and every person in Birmingham. And do you know that we've got quite an opportunity here in Birmingham? The latest U.S. Census report said that we have 1,140,300 people in greater Birmingham. And every one of them is going to end up in one of those numbers. But you know they're not numbers, right? Every number has a name. And every number has a face. And every face was made in God's image. And every single one of them is going to spend eternity somewhere. Because everyone spends eternity somewhere. I am, and you are, and you are, and you are. 
and your neighbor is and your coworker is and your friends are and your nephew is and your daughter-in-law is and that guy that works behind the desk at the gym you go to and that cashier at your favorite grocery store is going to and the pest control guy is going to and the gal that cuts your hair, they're all going to spend eternity somewhere. And listen, I want you to know something. I love ministry and I love the local church. I love church stuff. I love church people. I love all our church events and, and, and all that. But what could be more important to the ministry, to the vision and mission of our church than that, than the idea that everyone spends eternity somewhere. And what gets me up in the morning and what lights my fire isn't another church event or just all the ministry stuff or all the things that we often do to keep church people busy. What gets me up in the morning is helping people who feel judged and condemned find out that they are forgiven and loved and that there is mercy available. What gets me up in the morning is seeing people pass from death to life, seeing people who feel like visitors with God find a home with Jesus and in the community of faith. I don't know about you, but I want to spend the rest of my life overpopulating heaven with people from Birmingham. There's a scoreboard. Let's try to win. The thing I love about the Apostle Paul is his commitment to winning this competition. Now, if you, some, many of you probably know a lot about Paul, but if you don't know much about him, he's actually not one of the 12 disciples. He was a later convert. In fact, uh, Paul wasn't even known as Paul. He was known as Saul, and he was anything but sympathetic to the cause of Jesus. He was a Jewish religious leader or scholar known as a Pharisee, and he wasn't just opposed to the message of Jesus. He was antagonistic to the message of Jesus. We would call him zealously antagonistic. He threatened Christians. He uh, persecuted the early church and even stood by in approval while Christians were being murdered. Man, and then he met Jesus. Then he met Jesus and everything changed. Now, the good news about this is that if you have ever wondered if your past disqualifies you from being used by God, if God can use Paul, God can use you. If God can use Paul, God can use you, because I don't know how bad your past is, but you probably didn't stand in approval while Christians were being murdered, right? It was probably a little less bad than that. So if God can use Paul, God can use you. And Jesus gave Paul such an amazing message and ministry. In fact, Jesus said of Paul that this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, to non-Jews, to their kings, and to the people of Israel. Not just to one little group, but to everybody now, this was radically different than the strategy and the methods that all the other disciples were using. Peter and John and all the other disciples, the guys that had been with Jesus, had been leading what was a largely Jewish movement. Jesus was Jewish. They were all Jewish. And they just figured, well, I'm just supposed to reach Jews, right? That's just what I'm supposed to do. Peter dabbled in Gentiles, reaching Gentiles. He, he had a few moments, but he just always came back to being kind of laser focused on Jews. And that's just what they thought it would do. There were Romans and Greeks and non-Jews all around the disciples, but they were just blind to them. But God literally opened Paul's eyes to a hurting world. And he began sharing the message with everyone and everyone began to respond. Now you can imagine when you start doing things that have never been done, you start getting some criticism. Church folks tend to say, well, we haven't done it that way before. You ever heard that? From, has that ever been said in church? You ever heard that said in church? Well, that's not the way we've done it before. We've never done it that way. And Peter and John and all the other disciples begin to say to John, hey, begin to say to Paul, hey, Paul, we haven't done it that way before. You know, we, Paul, you're, I mean, you're talking to some Gentiles and they're kind of the wrong kind of people, Paul. They, you know, they're kind of the riffraff. 
Listen, they don't look like us church folk. They don't act like us church folk. They don't dress like us church folk. Uh, Paul, listen, you're, they're really different, you know. Paul, listen, your numbers are really skyrocketing. Are, is that all you care about is numbers, Paul? And Paul, if, you're, if so many people, if you're reaching so many people, I think you're, you know, I think you're watering down the message, right? So Paul writes a letter to the Christians in Corinth. And in that letter, he responds to some questions that, they've had, that people have had. And in it, he also responds to this criticism that he's watering down the message and that he's reaching the wrong kinds of people and that he's, you know, that he's just doing things that haven't been done. And I want you to listen closely to his strategy and ask yourself this question, what if the church, what if our church, what if I personally adopted his strategy to reach the world? I'll be having it on the screen here, but if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. Uh, as you leave, there are some free Bibles uh, out either door, and we'd love for you to take one. There's some stuff in your bulletin for you to study along and kind of go further, take the next step this week. So we hope that uh, you'll take that and read that, and for, please take one of our Bibles. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you've got your Bibles or you're using your phone and you're following along, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Starting in verse 20, this is an actual letter that Paul wrote, and he's responding to questions, and he's responding to criticisms. And this is what it says in the first part of verse 20. It says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. I was respectful of their customs, and I honored their culture because I want to gain influence among them. Do you get that? I was respectful of them, of their culture, of their way of life. I became like them because I want to gain influence. And now why do I want to do this? Paul says it's pretty easy. Why does he want to do it? To win. Paul's all about winning. To win the Jews. The old King James Version says to gain and the Greek word means to acquire or to gain uh, or to win over. It's an accounting term. Paul says someone somewhere is counting and I want to win them because if someone somewhere is counting, these people count. Now that was easy though because they're Jews and nobody was opposed to reaching Jews and Paul was a Jew. It's pretty easy to become like them. You're one of them. But then he goes on to the next verse. And he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So what Paul is saying is, to those who rigorously, rigorously obey all the 600 plus laws in Leviticus, to those who are strict about it, I don't have to do it because I have found freedom in Christ. And I know that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. So through Christ, I have followed all the laws. I don't have to do it. And they have some funny laws. They don't eat certain foods. They dress a certain way. They don't go out at certain times of the weekend. So Paul says, so you know what? When I'm around them, if there's certain foods they don't eat, I don't eat them around them. If there's a certain way they dress, I dress that way around them. If there's a certain time in the week that we can't meet because of their religious laws, then we don't meet during those times. I am respectful of their laws, of their culture, because I want to have a voice with them. Now, why in the world would I go to all that trouble to honor someone else's culture and their way of life? Why would I do that? Because what do I want to do? I want to win. So as to win those under the law, I want them to know that I will put my preferences and my way on the back burner for them because I am for them. And then Paul says, this, it, it, he goes further. Then he says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having law. What Paul says, to those not having the law, to, people, to those that are not respectful of the way of God at all, they are just basically irreligious, godless, to people who do not respect the things of God at all. I became like them. Now you're like, so do we sin? Am I supposed to go to the club? What's this supposed to look like, right? 
Paul says, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. Paul says, no, I'm, I'm still, I'm not free from God's law. In fact, God has upped the ante on me because I am guided by Christ's law, by the work of the Holy Spirit. I am under the rule of the Holy Spirit. So I don't sin, but I become like them. I, I want to get in their world. I want to understand when they talk about movies, I want to understand what movies they're talking about. I want to understand their music, so I listen to their music. I want to understand their cultural references, so I got, I've got to learn. See, this is going to take some work, Paul says. I have to become like them so that I can learn their world, so that I can learn their way, so that I can gain influence among them. So when I am around them, though I am under Christ's law, I talk like they talk. I, have the, I, I talk about the music they talk about. I talk about the movies they talk about. I dress the way they dress, not because I am trying to manipulate them, because I care about them because I want to honor them, because I respect who they are and where they are, and because somebody somewhere is counting. And those people who have no respect for the things of God count. And doggone it, why am I doing it? Because I want to win. I want to win them over. I'm not trying to beat them. I'm not in a competition with them. I'm in a competition for them. And I want to win them over. And then Paul has one last group. He says, to the weak, I became weak. And oh man, it's messy with the weak sometimes. Like you, when you get down when, on their level with the weak, there's addictions down there. There's really bad dysfunctional family dynamics. There's financial crisis. But it's not comfortable at all. At all. And Paul says, but I got down on their level. I got down with the, with the weak, in the mess, in the muck, in the mire, because I want to be with them. So I became like them. I got down in it on their level because it's not about me being comfortable. It's about them being comfortable with me. And I did it for one reason, as messy as it was, because I want to win the weak. And then Paul has his pinnacle statement, his pinnacle statement. And it's almost as if he's saying like, in case I missed a group, you remember the groups, right? To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To those who what? Had the law, I became like those who had the law. To those who didn't have the law, I became like those who didn't have the law. To the weak, I became weak. And then it's almost as if Paul says, in case there are any groups that I might have missed, let me tell you about my mission, my vision, my focus. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, all possible means, all possible means, say it with me, all possible means, I'll do anything and everything, it takes what it takes, whatever it takes, so that I might save some. This is 100%, 1,000%, all about winning. That's all that matters. That's all it's about. It's about winning to get people from the visitor stands to the home stands. This is a competition in eternity, and this matters so much. This, this supersedes and overrides everything else that our mission and our ministry is about. So church, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. And this is the first of three questions I'm going to ask you over the next three weeks. What is possible for a church committed to all possible means? What is possible for a church committed to all possible means? What is possible for an entire congregation, for everyone in this room, that if we would say, I'm committed to all possible means for Birmingham, to do anything and everything to reach my neighbors, I'm committed to all possible needs for my friends, for my coworkers, for my teammates, for my teachers, for my students. You need me to serve, I'll serve. Like, you need me to volunteer with kindergartners, and even though kindergartners scare me to death, I'll do it. You need me to stand out in the rain or in the cold and be on the parking lot team, I'll do it. You need me to be a greeter, I'll get here early to do it. You need me to serve an hour and worship with an hour, I'm going to do it. I'll give up my whole Sunday morning if that's what it takes for all possible means to just save some. If it makes a difference, if I make a difference, because I make good coffee, and I'll be on the coffee team. And if it makes a difference in one person, 
that I get here early and make a great cup of coffee, I'll do it. You need me to give more? I'll give more. You need me to give more? I'll give more. Because I'm just going to guess that people that move from the visitor stands to the home stands don't come with their checkbooks open. So I'm going to pay for my cup of coffee and their cup of coffee. And I'm going to pay for my air conditioning that I'm using up and their air conditioning that they're using up. And my heat and their heat. And I'm going to pay for my seat and their seat. And I'm going to do what you need me to give. I'm going to give over and above whatever I'm giving right now because I'm willing. If that's the all possible means it takes, it, because it might be my friend that shows up. And I hope somebody's paid for them. Hope somebody has invested in them for this. You need my expertise in an area, I, I'll lend my talents. You need me to invite a friend to church, whew, okay, I will uh, get up the gumption and over the butterflies and I'll fight through the awkwardness and I'll give them a card and say, hey, we, I'd love to have you come sit with me, come meet me out in the atrium. All possible means. I, I got to tell you something. I got about 20 or 25 years left of ministry. And I don't plan to spend it playing church. I plan to spend it playing the kingdom game to win. To win. To win. And we're going to have to do different things to reach different kinds of people. We're, we're going to have to do different things to reach children that don't know Jesus. And we're going to have to do different things to reach students that don't know Jesus. And we're going to have to do different things to reach single people who don't know Jesus. And different kinds of things to reach married people who don't know Jesus. The deal is we're going to have to do all kinds of different things to reach people who are visitors with God because they don't think like us and their culture is not ours. So we're going to have to become like them in order to reach them. And here's the deal. Here's the problem. Here's the question. And here's the worry. Right? This is the problem everybody had with Paul and the question everyone was asking. So, are we going to change what we're teaching? Is that, are we going to water down the message and kind of make it a little more palatable so it goes down a little more, you know, socially acceptable? Is that what we're doing? And Paul's answer to that would be, No! I didn't change the message, I changed me. I changed my behaviors, I changed my methods, I changed my preferences, I changed my strategies in order to make the message come alive in them. This is the last passage that Paul, last scripture in the passage where Paul wraps it up. He said, all this I did, become like in Jews and become like those who follow the law and those that don't follow the law and the weak. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. I did all that so that they can know the never changing story of God in Jesus Christ. So that, that it can become real, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so that they can find out for finally that God so loved the world that he sent his only son for them. Amen. For them. Because I want them to know this hope and this forgiveness and this mercy and this grace that I have found. And I'm willing to do anything and everything, all possible means, that they will know it even if it means I'm a little uncomfortable. So what does it mean to be a church that is committed to all possible means? Here's what I think it means. We will sacrifice preferences to save people and change methods to share an unchanging message. We will sacrifice preferences, our preferences, to save people. And we will change methods to share an unchanging message. We will change methods, and it will take continuing to change them and change them over and over and over. Because no preference and no method is sacred. Do you want to know what's sacred? Everybody in the visitor stands. They're sacred. So when we show a movie clip in worship, and you're like, ooh, that was a little edgy. I don't know if I've shown that one in church. It wasn't for you. That's okay. 
Or when we play a song by the Rolling Stones or Taylor Swift or Kanye, not new Kanye, old Kanye. <laughs> like new Kanye is cool in church, but old Kanye, I don't know about that old Kanye, you know. No, we should play that. When we play one of those songs and you're like, I don't know that we should be playing, you know, that kind of mu secular music or whatever. That's, we didn't play it for you. It wasn't about you. Because here's what I can tell you. Everyone that feels like a visitor with God, they don't know a hill song or elevation worship song from a Gaither or Charles Wesley hymn, but they know Taylor Swift and they know the Stones and they know Kanye. And we're trying to speak their language and enter into their culture and their world to change an unchanging message. And I'm convinced that if we're going to reach the generations that come behind us, that we are going to have to continually sacrifice generational preferences to reach them. And I happen to think millennials and Gen Z are worth it. I'm raising four Gen Zers, and I think they're worth it. So when you come Thursday night, you're going to come Thursday night, it's going to be bonkers in here. <laughs> and I want you to ask yourself this question, what if it takes that on Sunday mornings to reach Gen Z? I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. There was a lot of dancing and... Are you willing to sacrifice a preference to save people? Are you willing to change a method to share a message? Someone did that for you. Do you know that? Someone thought you were worth it. They thought you were worth it so much that 27 years ago, they started a church to reach Birmingham. That church was Mountaintop Community Church that started in a living room with a man named Pastor Bill Elder. All right, you think you're ready? I think so. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Hey y'all, I'm sitting here with Pastor Bill Elder and many of you have probably met him, but if you haven't, he <coughs> is the founding pastor and started Mountaintop back in 1992. So Bill, tell me a little bit about your background in starting Mountaintop Community Church. Where I always turned was the Great Commission itself. And I always had deep down in my heart the thought that a church should be free and dedicated and unselfish enough to reach the unchurched, as Jesus put it in the, I mean, when he says to go reach the nations, yeah. the nations he then defines as the unchurched. Yeah. You know, you're going to baptize people who are not baptized. That's right. And you're going to teach people who are not taught. Mm. What was the original mission and vision of the church? It was... Uh, look, you know, exactly what Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says. He meets with his disciples after the resurrection. He told the women who met him at the tomb to go tell them to meet him in Galilee. And they knew where because it was their favorite mountain top. Mm. You know? Yeah. You know, and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And, and as I said, the nations is clearly the ones who have not found the church yet. The thing I love about that passage from Matthew is what would you do if all authority in heaven and earth had been given to you? And Jesus uses his authority to leverage it and says, For I want you to go reach others yeah. Yeah, with this message. So why, why did you feel called to start Mountaintop? And I, I was passionate, very passionate about was how do you make, I mean, how do you get the good news of the gospel to people who are, have missed it a while? And, and so I was open to, to the command as it came and God was working on my heart to say, let's, let's go. 
And in that experience, I saw what could happen when the church took seriously the Great Commission. And, and we're, not, we're selfless enough to say this isn't about us, this is about them. Mm. And we sang a song. I will not sing it for you at this point. <laughs> but it goes, the words are, wherever you lead me, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. I want your spirit, my life to control. And then to others, your love I will show. That was it. And by mm. the time we finished that, my heart was jumping out of my chest. That's good. It reminds me, one of my favorite lyrics is, uh, says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Yeah, great. And um, it's sort of that, that no, same that, thing. That's, that's what's happened. That was what was happening to me. And my heart was finally broken. And I had, to, as an act of obedience, I had to come back to Birmingham and um, we started as they did in the New Testament church in the house church at this house right, right here so here it is this is the birthplace of Mount this Mount, is it this room this is it and from that point on it has been a miracle journey every step every step I, I've never seen such thing it took my breath away yeah and it has been a ride like I could never have imagined because we have a more than God yeah you know in, in Ephesians 3, it tells us that He can do more than we can even think or imagine. Yeah, immeasurably more. Immeasurably yeah. more, that's correct. Yeah. So we're in this new season, and as you look ahead, what do you think is possible for our church in the in the future? Well, you're, you know, you, you are stepping to the helm of a, of a church that has everything going for it because the you know, the, the heritage of the vision still lives in the hearts of many mm. who are there. So God does a new thing. Then the Bible also teaches in that kind of belief, anything is possible. In fact, not anything, it's everything is possible. Amen. So God's got vision for us much larger than ours. Amen. Do you think Pastor Bill Elder and his wife, Linda, thought this was possible? Bill said that when they got their very first building, it had 120 seats, and he said uh, that he told somebody, I just can't imagine we'll ever need more than 120. But God's dream was bigger. Do you think the Apostle Paul could have imagined that his solo efforts he was a one-man mission. His solo efforts to reach non-Jewish Gentiles and start these little house churches all along the Mediterranean. Do you think that he thought it was possible that 2,000 years later, a band of a few hundred believers, maybe a thousand, would have grown into today 2.4 billion Christians on planet Earth, most of which are Gentile? Do you, th you think he ever thought that was possible? I want you to imagine something. If one man can have that kind of impact on the world, what kind of impact can a whole church have on a city? What is possible for a church committed to all possible means for Birmingham? Well, maybe this matters more. What's possible if you're committed to all possible means for your friends, for your dad, for your son-in-law, for your niece, for your neighbor, for that guy in the cubicle across the little way at work. Because, you, I mean, you know this, right? It's not about numbers. Numbers don't get us up and get excited in the morning it's about names and every name on your mind and my, my mind right now was on Jesus' mind when he died for them on the cross and I just think it's just crazy we ought to do anything and everything for them to know about it. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you that you are a God who did anything and everything, who went to all possible means to show us the extent of your love. And it took you giving your son Jesus to die on the cross for us to figure it out. Thank you that you are an all possible means God. And Lord, right now, as we begin this new season together as a church and we think about like what's possible for us, really what it matters, God, is what we're thinking about is just one person at a time. And we're wondering, God, if you could, could it be possible that you would use us? That you would use us to reach our friends. Our neighbors. So Lord, here's what we want to confess to you today. Here's what we want to promise to you. Here's what we want to proclaim to you. We're committed. We're in. We are in, God, to do anything and everything, to go to all possible means. If you would use our efforts to do what only you can do and reach into human hearts one person at a time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.